You guys were born in Stanford? Yeah, we were born in Stanford, Connecticut. I was born in 42, Richard was born in 45, 1945. Two of us got along very well, Richard and myself, during our childhood. He was always smaller. He, he was born small and he, he, he always was the smallest person in the class. Of course, people stared at him, you know, when he walked into a room or a restaurant or whatever. It, it must have been a handicap, some sort of handicap. Yeah, and I think that's why he had to prove to everyone that he was some, you know, he was somebody and he was strong and he, strong in body, strong in mind. And I think that's, that's why he got the military in his head. He was little, he was always tiny, but he was hard as a rock. And in those days, you didn't lift weights, you didn't, nobody did that stuff. Rick, my boss. <laughs> That's him right there. So see, he's, he is small. I knew Richard from high school. We went to the same Catholic high school and he was really popular in high school. He was really smart and he was on the football team and he was invited to all the parties. There he is. This is 64. Richard Flaherty, the giant killer. He always said he wanted to be a military. He always wanted to be a military. And he, and he knew at the time that his height might prevent him from getting in. And uh, matter of fact, the first time he applied, they turned him down. So Walter, at this point, was a lawyer. So he asked Walter to write the congressman and have the politicians put a word into the army about this little guy who's, you know, he wants, he wants to do this. And uh, they finally approved it. It took a couple of years. And then when he went, he was underweight. And he, he said, they told him, you know, you have to gain some weight. You have to beef up a little bit, which he did. And he started lifting weights and everything. And they were gonna let him in with his height. He, he was just too skinny at the time. Yeah. So he did, he did that and he beefed up and uh, worked really hard. And, and he told him, he says, I can do it. I can do it. Why just give me a chance? I can do it. And he was the littlest person in the United States military. Uh, he got a special con a congressional waiver, I guess it was, to go into the military. He never made a, a complaint about boot camp or about it being unfair, or that, because that it should make some sort of accommodation because of the height disadvantage. He would jump out of the plane first, they'd watch to see where he went, and then they'd circle around and jump the rest of the company after him. You're gonna exit an aircraft in a special forces training operation. Uh, you're gonna be carrying generators, you're gonna be carrying weapons, you got your parachute system. So you'd be jumping anywhere from 80 to 100 pounds easily. You know, so that's a lot of stuff to carry. When you're only four foot nine, it's that much harder to carry that. In fact, his, his rucksack, which you strapped on below your reserve parachute, it had to be close to hanging on the ground. So for him to get out of the aircraft with his rucksack down here on his shins, that's pretty tough to move. You know, the rest of us, it was maybe at our knees, but he, he would have had it down close to his feet. Uh, so it's physically harder for him to do that. I would have never even questioned his ability to do it because just from the standpoint of who he was, I mean, he's just tough, so he could do it. He, he did it. You know, and that's that's hard training. It's hard stuff to get through. There's a lot of guys to this day that put in for SF training and never make it. A lot of guys put in for, you know, uh, 101st Airborne stuff and they, they never make it. But you saw those pictures that you had of him with all his military stuff on, running with a rifle. And the, and the caption was, I think, smallest man in the military. Captain Rick Lencioni invited me up to the 101st Airborne's reunion to see if I could find more men that knew Richard. I thought that they might be reluctant to talk to me because I was a stranger in their world. But it was the opposite. They gladly shared their experiences and stories with me, hoping the next generation understands the sacrifices they and their friends gave for their country. That's when we arrived. When you first got to Vietnam? Right. Well, we didn't know what we were gonna really get into when we left Fort Campbell. We found out in a hurt, especially in January, February 1968, when the Tet Offense was kicked off. We found out right quick what it was like to be in Vietnam. Well, the first time I saw him, it was sort of funny because he was 
real little guy, and we thought it was a joke to start with, but uh, turned out that he was our platoon leader. <laughs> yeah, I never seen anybody smaller than them on there, other than the Vietnamese. But everybody knew Richard. He stood out. For a little guy, he had a big voice, and you know his his, his voice carried. Maybe it was something he had practiced, but it worked. It was a little strange to see a guy that small. It was very strange. When I first looked at him, I did a double take. But I remember seeing recon platoon going across the rice paddy over there. They were just kind of all spread out, moving across there. And he was right in the front, leading. Had his map out. He was looking at the map, and he had this big stogie. <laughs> stogie was bigger than him. But I remember he was leading and they were following. And to me, I said, he's a good leader. Uh, there was a doubt that he was in charge. I saw the respect that was there too, because they knew that he, he you know, he, he could be um, stringent at times. He always had that attitude. He had that tough guy attitude. Even though he was really short, he was always really tough looking and always a uh, very outspoken and forceful individual. But uh, he was very smug, too. He was very smug about it. He just had that attitude. He was a tough little prick, but they like tough little pricks when you're in combat. They don't want that, you know, milk toasty guy. He was full of fire, you know. They're always willing to go, willing to do whatever needs to be done. We would get these telegrams. Your son has been wounded. And then, then a week or less later, we get another telegram. He's back in action again. You know, so he, even the, his wounds didn't stop him from uh, carrying out his mission. That motherfucker's tough. Yeah. Have a lot of respect for that guy. He is a tough son of a bitch. One thing I didn't notice about Richard right away was he was pretty tough on the enemy. At that point, there were no prisoners uh, being taken and I don't know if that was Richard's doing or not, but he certainly didn't show any emotion towards what had happened. It was when Flaherty and I did the operation uh, sweeping the village, going down, we were actually on opposite sides of a river. And I think it was in what we called the Eight Bill at that time. It was this long 8,000 meter village that ran with a river running through it. And it was a known area where you're gonna get contact. You never went in the Eight Click Bill without running into the enemy. For some reason, they just kept coming back there. And so we're doing a sweep, and uh, my unit had jumped some uh, North Vietnamese and Viet Cong on one side of the river. And uh, we shot several of them, uh, but they did not, they weren't dead. And I was gonna call for a medevac helicopter, uh, you know, a dust off to get them out of there. So, cause I had the medics work on them and you know, look like, okay, well, they're about as stable as they're gonna get. And so I'm radioing over to Richard and I said, uh, I've, I've got uh, two uh, Victor Charlie WIA. And he said, Roger, two Victor Charlie KIA. And I said, no, no, WIA. I said, so, when did, you know, Whiskey India Alpha. And he says, no, he kept coming back with the KIA. And I knew what he was saying, cause he was saying basically, what, let's just move on, kill them, let's just go. And I had guys in my platoon that are looking at me going, no, we don't want to do this. And so I said, no, we're going to evacuate them. And I made Richard stand down, and wait till we got a chopper in there. A lot of things that happened like that over there, you just, as soon as it was over, you forgot about it. Later on in the tour, I became Richard's company commander. So now he's still platoon leader, he's reporting to me. He came in one time to come see me, and Richard would wear this revolver on his hip, and it had white handles on it, almost like a pearl handle type revolver. I have no idea what it was really made of, but that's what it looked like. It was like a six gun. And he took it out of the holster and pointed it at me. And he's smiling, and he spun it back and put it back in the holster. And then he does it again. Now, we haven't really said a word to each other, and he puts it back in the holster, and he's smiling all this time. And I had my rifle down like this, and I went click, click, which goes from basically safe to full automatic. And he heard that. I said, Richard, if that clears that holster again, I'm going to stitch you from your toes to the top of your head. And he just looked at me and smiled, and he turned around and walked away. 
He never said a word during that whole encounter. I was the only one to talk. Why do you think he did that? Get a reaction from me. He wanted to see what I'd do. See if he could scare me. You know, he he looked for a fight. So I, I just I asked him one day, hey, uh, you got got any trouble lately? He said, no, but I'm looking for something, you know. In the uh, late summer of 68, I was listening in on the battalion net and Marie Comp platoon, which Richard was commanding at the time, had come into contact with a large NVA force, which was, I don't know if we ever really determined how big the force was, but it was a lot larger than, than his recon platoon. They had set up a defensive perimeter and they were being attacked all night long. The, the NVA, their purpose was to overrun them, to basically kill every one of them. And nobody ever had it in their mind that they were going to surrender. So, and I can guarantee you in Richard's platoon, that was not a thought that anybody would have. They're not going to surrender. And the fight be it began and they fought all night long. They fought with everything they had. Uh, a lot of them were, became casualties. In fact, I think uh, probably a majority of the platoon was some type of casualty, either killed or wounded. But in the morning, they came out of it. And uh, with the ones that were left that were still able to fight had fought all through the night. They killed, I don't want to say a hundred, but probably close to that of North Vietnamese were killed in that engagement. There was a big pile of NVA dead around them, but they were still there. And Richard commanded that whole thing. Nobody could get to him. The last thing he ever wanted to do was run out of ammunition. And I'm sure that night he was probably getting close to it. And I'd heard nothing on the net that night that indicated he was getting any form of relief. And they, they couldn't have done an airdrop into a tight perimeter like that. You'd probably be giving it to the North Vietnamese. You, know, you can't you can't be that pinpoint accurate on an airdrop. Richard had several casualties. It was just constant. I mean, all of us did. I don't know if he lost more than others or not. He was a very aggressive officer. So there's a chance that he would have lost more people because he was very aggressive and in moving to contact to, to engage the enemy. Um, but I can tell you that his men didn't rebel against him for that because they trusted him. As far as being a good platoon leader, I think he'd done an outstanding job.